Welcome to chapter 21. We are going to look at what happens when the interstellar medium begins to form into stars and planets and other kinds of fun stuff out there. Uh, we're also going to look at exoplanets and how we can begin to detect planets that are outside of our own solar system. The thing that I like best about this topic is this topic didn't exist when I was taking 100 level astronomy classes. Way, way back in the dark ages, otherwise known as the early 1980s, we had no idea whether or not there were planets around other stars or not. We had a pretty good guess, but guessing isn't good enough in science. You have to know. And it wouldn't be until more than a dozen years after I took my first courses in astronomy that we got the first verification of any planets around any stars at all. And now, of course, we find them everywhere. And it's, it's not as big a deal as it used to be. But I remember the whole field of exoplanets was reduced basically to one sentence in my textbook, that someday someone may find proof around other stars of planets and they were speculating that it would probably be about 25 to 50 years. Well, it happened in 12. So now it's a thing of the past that we've discovered that, and we've known about exoplanets with verification for 25 years. So if you are under 25 years of age, we've known about them all your life. If you're a little bit over 25, like I am, uh, actually more than half my life, we didn't know anything at all about them. That is the speed with which science changes. Uh, so things change, things, our knowledge multiplies and our knowledge deepens and our knowledge expands in ways that we might not have ever even really thought of before. So uh, some of the things we'll talk about today are also equally relatively new in terms of astronomy. So without any further ado, let me do the share screen thing here again. And we will go to the birth of stars and discovery of planets outside our solar system. And let's play the slideshow here. Yay. Uh, we talked about interstellar media. We talked about gas and dust. We not talked about molecules, atoms, and other particles that are out there. This is part of the Carina Nebula. It's a different kind of view. Often we sort of see it in a different uh, slant. But one of the things that we can tell is that there are stars inside those clouds because we see the light coming out of the clouds. And we can see that in visual light. We can see that in Roy G. Bibb. We can see that in infrared and various other wavelengths as well. Uh, so we have quite a number of really new stars in here. And what, part of the way we know that they're new stars is they haven't completely blown the gas and dust away from them, even in their pockets where they're forming. Uh, we, we see that they still have these envelopes that tell us they're relatively new. It takes a while for that stuff to blow away. So here's another example. This is the uh, Eagle Nebula, the, the pillars of creation. Uh, what we see here is the sort of the gas and dust being illuminated. On the end here, this B figure is actually the tip of the largest column over here in A. Uh, this is one of the earliest pictures of Hubble, and it was part of what helped make its reputation. Then this image, this particular image, was taken uh, a couple of decades later as they were doing a retrospective of early images versus later images. There's not a lot of change between the two in terms of actual physical changes because 20 years is not a long time for these things to, to develop. But the pictures themselves are different because our technology in the Hubble has been upgraded since then. So we have some, some very dense areas that are sort of collapsing in on themselves. Uh, when we're, we're talking about sizes, one of the things you might notice in our narrative down here, this longest pillar here says it's about a light year long. If you think about a light year, uh, as being the distance that light travels in a year. Our entire solar system is probably about like that size. I could almost touch my fingers and that would be about the size of ours. We're not a light year. We're not a light half year. We're not a light quarter year. We're not a light month. We're actually much, 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 much smaller than that. So these pillars of gas and dust will coalesce into very small things relative to these sizes here. 
We've talked about the Orion Nebula a couple of different times too, and when we look at it in infrared in particular, we can see where the heat pockets are of the different stars that are forming. These are hundreds if not thousands of stars that are forming in the Orion Nebula, which is part of the Orion constellation. Uh, here we have a close-up of the area that is sort of right in the middle here. We can penetrate through some of the gas and dust looking at infrared when we talked about the ways in which light gets transmitted and blocked by gas and dust. Infrared makes it through a little bit more easily uh, there. If you look at this image with your high-powered binoculars or your backyard telescope, and you can in fact get this image, it will often appear black and white. And part of that reasoning is because as the light is hitting your eye, your eye isn't absorbing and collecting it the way a timed exposure would be able to collect it, which is what we're seeing here. These are actually timed exposures where you have a process that's, off, uh, that's often used, it's called stacking, where you have an image and 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 you build up the image. Your eye can't do that. Uh, so, so that's one of the differences that you would see from actually going in person to look through the eyepiece of a telescope and looking at photographs that have been produced by uh, telescopes. Here we're getting closer to the trapezium, which is the central part of the Orion Nebula. We can see a lot of stars as we're sort of looking through, again, the infrared. This is Roy G. Biv. This is infrared. Notice how it becomes transparent there. But we see a lot of stars, and we see a lot of big stars there in the middle. Uh, those will burn themselves out rather quickly. This is another area uh, within the Carina er uh, uh, area where we can see gas and dust being blown away by the stars in the cluster here that are being formed and beginning to push things out along the way. Uh, so that, that's part of what happens. When we're looking at the different kinds of star formation through our, our clouds of, of stars, we can tell there are different groupings. Older groups tend to be more spread out, younger groups tend to be clustered a little bit more. And when they're still within the molecular clouds, uh, pretty much there's just either brand new stars or maybe even proto stars just about to kick on their engines or just starting to kick on their engines. So stars form in these regions. They form in uh, the, the areas of gas and dust, the interstellar medium, which we've already discussed in a previous chapter. Stars form when that gas and dust, when that ISM, the interstellar medium, cools off to the extent that gravity takes over. Gravity is a relatively weak force under the short distance, under, under the, in, in the short run. So any kind of energetic activity usually from temperatures, kinetic uh, uh, energy, will keep things from glomming together gravitationally. But as they cool, that will take over. So our gas and dust will begin to clump as it cools in different ways. And each clump will have higher gravity because it's got more mass. So more mass means more gravity uh, to pull yet more and more and more. And that whole process begins through what we call fragmentation. So from this fragmentation here, we can see where we get a bunch of different stars in a cluster that would be forming. So we have different sort of seed, seedlets of, of, of stars that are forming. Uh, every particular particle, though, still has its energy, its temperature, and that adds it to the whole, which is why these areas that begin to clump together not only have a high pressure, but they also have building temperature again. And the gravity plus the temperature, if the clump gets large enough, will then kick on the fusion reaction inside and turn it into a star. A large cloud can make a whole cluster of, of uh, stars. The Pleiades cluster, for example, which has hundreds of stars that we can see even through uh, a, a relatively low power telescope all come effectively from the same cloud, as well as the big uh, half dozen or so major stars that are part of that. Sometimes we have small isolated star formation clouds, this sort of small clouds that only have enough 
in them to form maybe one or two stars. See, this is a, uh, we might even play a Rorschach test with this image here. Uh, I say it looks like Australia. Uh, there are other people who see different kinds of things that are in it along the way. You can you can send me a, a message and tell me what it looks like, and I'll tell you whether Rorschach says you should see a therapist or not. Uh, but this one, I would actually say, would probably clump into two different stars uh, rather than one. For a long time, there was a theory that our sun was an isolated star, and it, it had formed from a very small cloud that gave it isolated star formation, which is why we're not part of a cluster, and our planets go around in an almost perfect circle because there was nothing else around to pull them off in different directions. We've since come to modify that thinking uh, quite, quite a bit, uh, but this actually still seems to happen out there. You may remember something I referenced in earlier lectures called a Bach globule, a uh, dark kind of hole in the sky kind of thing. That's what this may be here. But as things begin to contract, we have what's called protostars that form. The matter continues to fall into these areas of growing material, so growing uh, gravity that begins to enlarge itself, but also in the center, it's being compressed. So there's an upper limit to how much it can take on before that pressure will build up and kick on the engine inside. And when that happens, we have a burst of energy that begins to blow uh, the, the surrounding gases away. So the protostar stage is when we see the gases beginning to blow away. So we have the fragmentation stage, we have protostars beginning to form. This would be sort of one of these fragments here. Uh, as it begins to glom together, it all, all the particles also have motion that blends together. So things are in motion and they add to their motion and it's spinning. As it begins to spin, we have magnetic forces, we have heat forces, and we have other uh, dynamic forces that begin to give us our disk of material around and the polar regions that will sometimes have jets of energy coming out of them uh, in, in different ways. So we have this free fall time taking effect under gravity. It really, the time for it really depends upon the energy level and the temperature levels inside the cloud itself at the start. Protostar will be in the middle here. The area around it we have is called an accretion disk. Uh, when the material gloms together, it's said to accrete. When two particles come together and gravity holds them together, we're saying that they're accreting together. Uh, so so uh, we, we have that holding things together. And this continues until we reach a point where fusion will begin inside. Uh, here we can see protostars with the jets of energy on either side uh, through the poles, and we can sort of see the dark band in the middle here, which is part of the accretion disk, which is cooler than the rest of the area here. So that's why it, it seems to be darker. Uh, and, and one of the things that we see is that this is very variable over the course of just a few years as we're looking at it. So here we have other sort of out flows, these images from the Hubble, uh, so, so we can sort of see sort of being thrown off in different directions. Remember these images, if you will, because when we look at galactic formation, uh, the, the formation of large groups of stars, some of them will also have jets that look similar to this, sometimes not though in particles or uh, uh, sort of Roy G. Biv kinds of energy or, or large uh, kinds of energy like this uh, at, at high wavelengths, sometimes we have what are called radio galaxies that are sending out uh, uh, things like this for hundreds of thousands of light years in uh, radio waves. Here we can see different disks around protostars. We had no idea, again, back when I was uh, taking this class, Hubble was still in the dreaming stage uh, back then. They'd already started constructing it, but no one knew exactly what we were going to get out of it when it got up there. 
Uh, I was taking these classes in the early 80s. Hubble went up in 1990. It didn't become super effective until 1993 because there were some glitches at the beginning and we had to send a shuttle up to help prepare it. Uh, uh, um, and, and it was really after 1993 that things began to take off and we were able to see things like this that we had never seen before. And we, in, in some ways, hadn't even imagined before. Uh, so we have these different stars with gas and dust around them in the early formation stage of the star. So we call them still protostars. So as protostars begin to contract, they, they sort of fall in under their own weight until the engine inside kicks on. When the engine kicks on, we go to our handy HR diagram, which you might remember when we were talking about different types of stars, and they end up on the main sequence. The main sequence means the engine is running and they are processing hydrogen into helium. Lower mass stars collapse down into here, medium mass stars here, higher mass stars up here. Uh, so the protostars would be hanging out here where our instability strips are, remember those variable stars we talked about before, and where some of the late stage stars would be as well. Uh, so, so that's a rather interesting mix of stars as well. So we have what we're, we might call the birth line uh, when, when the gases and dust begin to coalesce and they shrink down until under falling in under their own weight until the engine kicks on and it begins to push out. We talked about this when we talked about the sun in chapters 15 and 16, how gravity pulls the material in but the engine pushes out and they're in what we would call a hydrostatic equilibrium. Stars on the main sequence are in hydrostatic equilibrium here. So protostars spin is amplified. One of the things we see as it shrinks down, it spins faster and faster. So gas clouds are actually in motion, but they're spinning very, very slowly along the way. Part of that spin, however, will be taken over by the accretion disk. So the materials outside there will also take some of that energy. And as it falls more and more into itself, we have, again, our disk, our accretion disk, our outflows as our jets, and this whole bubble here uh, is still a gassy envelope. And we still have, even with our own star with the sun, the residual of some of that original envelope around. If we look closely at some of the pictures that we've gotten of protostars, we will see protoplanets. We have clumps in the material which will not grow into large enough objects to be stars if they turn into uh, a planetary system. Sometimes, in fact, we do have a large star and a small star that will both form in a, a system like this. But protostars that are not too much larger than our sun and are forming uh, planetary systems, protostars have protoplanets, we call that the T-Tauri phase. Here we can see, again with uh, the aid of Hubble, uh, different stars where we have the disk of material around them. And we can see the heat already coming off of the stars in the center there. The glowing is, uh, again, the residual heat. These are stars that have not quite kicked on their engines yet. And here we have a couple of others that we're able to see. Uh, one of the things, the, the left view is the Hubble. Uh, that, that we have here. Uh, the right image is a model, uh, so these are computer-generated models uh, that, that make it a little more clear where the central star is. It's all blocked out a little bit, uh, so we use a, a, a sort of a, what's called a chronograph, and that is something that blocks out. We can put it over the sun so that we can see the corona. We can actually do that technique with stars as well so that it doesn't just blare out all the details. Uh, so we've got that going for us here. And this was made by the ALMA, uh, the Atacama Desert down in Chile. We talked a little bit about that a couple of times when I was showing you uh, different, different equipment, things that are being used. Uh, this shows uh, sort of dust and debris and so, sort of blank spaces, alleys in there. That's where it's already beginning to coalesce into protoplanets. So we have our protostar surrounded by different areas that are going to be where the protoplanets are. 
as we are looking out at the different stars, we can use the Doppler method for detecting planets. Uh, one, one of the things that we, we will, will see, and I'll, I'll show you this here uh, in, in just a bit in a little more detail, as stars themselves are spinning, we can tell the direction they're spinning when the light gets a little bit of a kick in one direction or a little bit of a tug in the other. Sometimes we also see the planets tugging and pulling on the stars ever so slightly, but we can measure that along the way. So I will, we'll get back to this one here in just a moment. Uh, the first exoplanet discoveries came in 1995. Now these are the first ones that were verified. Uh, and it was around a star in the constellation Pegasus. It was just the 51st star, hence 51 Pegasi uh, here. So it wasn't around Betelgeuse, and it wasn't around Sirius, and it wasn't around Aldebaran, and it wasn't around a star that has what we might consider a proper name. It was run-of-the-mill star, 51st star in Pegasus. But it was the one that was demonstrating some wobble effects that were later identified to be the cause uh, caused by planets that were around it. We had discovered a planet around a pulsar before 1995, uh, and we discovered a couple of other things that we later figured out we were seeing planets, but we didn't know what they were at the time. So it was really 1995 that we attribute, yes, we have now discovered planets, we verified planets around other stars. The larger a planet is around a star, the easier it is to detect. That's a no-brainer. Uh, so, so remember that. The larger a planet is, the easier it is to detect. So guess what? We've found more large planets than we have, in general, small planets, especially earlier in our hunting for, for other planets, because they're just easier to spot. Also, the closer they are to their star, the easier they are to spot. And I'll show you why here in just a, a few minutes. But we've found quite a number of large planets that are closer to their stars, and we call those hot Jupiters. I often wish Starbucks would sell like a, 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 a hot Jupiter kind of a, a, a coffee drink. So I'll have a grande hot Jupiter to go or something like that. We don't tend to get pictures like this because when we've got a planet that close to the star, uh, the star's light is going to overwhelm it. So we have uh, quite a few artist impressions. Uh, I'll try to highlight when they're actual photos uh, for you. But one of the ways in which we detect planets around stars is through wobbling. And this is an indirect method. Of course, the best way would be just to take a picture of the planet itself around the star. But again, the stars are usually so, so, so much brighter than the planet. Uh, the, it bleeds out. And you can sort of see that effect for yourself if you go out at night and look for Jupiter uh, and you look at it with the naked eye, you're probably seeing Jupiter and several moons, but they're so close together and Jupiter's light is so bright, they all bleed together and you can't tell them apart. If you get even 10 by 50 binoculars and look at Jupiter again, it will actually separate out the lights but Jupiter is very close to us relative to other planets around other stars. So mostly we use indirect methods, and indirect methods mean how the planet is affecting the star, and therefore we can tell something is affecting it, it must be a planet. And one of the number one ways is the gravitational tug. In physics, if you have two things that are of equal mass, they'll go around each other, and the center of gravity will be exactly halfway between them, all other things being equal. If this one is twice as much as this one, the center of gravity will be closer to the large one, but it won't be the middle of the large one. So you'll have the smaller thing going like this, but you'll have the larger thing doing a smaller circle, and it'll still be around that center of gravity, but that center of gravity will shift it towards the larger thing. That's true in our own solar system. The sun is a thousand times larger than Jupiter. And even so, when Jupiter is going around the sun, it looks like it's going around the sun. In fact, the sun isn't just sitting there. When Jupiter's over here, the sun moves a little bit this way. When Jupiter comes back over here, the sun moves a little bit this way. So when we're watching Jupiter do this, the sun is actually doing this going back and forth. It's tugging a little bit back and forth. 
if you can't see Jupiter, because from Alpha Centauri, from Sirius, from Betelgeuse, you might not be able to see Jupiter, even with a Hubble-type telescope at your disposal, but you would be able to see the sun doing this, moving back and forth. And you might say, what's making it wobble like that? Well, planets, that's what's happening. Now, Jupiter takes about 12 years to go around. So you'd have to watch the sun for 24 to 36 years, because you want to see the wobble more than once. Because if it's just doing this, it could just keep going like that. It could just be going around something. It doesn't mean it's necessarily going back and forth. You need to see a pattern repeat. So it would be a long time to watch the sun go six years, 12 years, 18 years, 24 years, 30 years. If you really want to have it happen three times before you are, are sure, that's job security, but it's also a long time for funding. Uh, all of the planets actually influence the sun this way. Some of them cancel each other out to a little bit uh, of an extent. And of course, Mercury is much, 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 much smaller. It's also closer, but it doesn't really do all that much to the sun. Jupiter's further out, it does more. Saturn's even further out and it's, it's smaller than Jupiter, but even it causes the, the sun to tug back and forth. And the planets pull on each other. That's another issue we'll talk about when we talk about relativity and Einstein. So keep that in mind. Uh, uh, along the way. But our sun wobbles back and forth in response to Jupiter. We can actually measure the center of mass of our sun and the center of mass of the Jupiter sun system there. And, and it sort of, it moves back and forth in response to that. So as we're watching other planets, we look for the wobble back and forth. Another type of wobble that we can tell, if, especially if we're looking at it edge on, Let's say my head is the planet here. If a planet is, or let's say my head is the star, sorry, my head is the star, my finger is the planet. If the planet is here in front of the star, the star is back a little bit. If the planet goes around behind, then the star goes forward a little bit. Because again, it's doing that, that tug and wobble kind of thing. But now, since it's going around like this, it's going forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards. When it's going forwards, it's giving the light a little blue kick, a little blue shift. When it's going backwards, it's tugging on the light, it's giving it a little red shift. So when we see blue shift, red shift, blue shift, red shift, blue shift, red shift, aha, we've seen it again three times. Uh, what, try to establish a pattern there, especially if we also can see it and we see it wobbling back and forth like this, what we figured out is that it's going in a circle because we're getting tugged to the left, red shift, tugged to the right, blue shift, tugged to the left, red shift, tugged to the right, blue shift. When we see that happening, but we don't see the planet, we can still know there's something going around that's causing the star to do that. We see this red shift and blue shift by taking the light from the spectrum and we look at the lines and see whether they're shifted. And we can actually analyze that down to walking speed. So it doesn't have to be going anywhere close to the speed of light. The first star that we found with this kind of thing happening was, as I mentioned, 51 Pegasi. The Doppler shifts and the wobble showed it had a planet that was going around in about four days. That's really fast. Mercury goes around our star closest planet in, in 88 days. Pluto takes 250 years. Jupiter, the big uh, planet that, that tugs the most on the star, takes about 12 years to go around. This is four days, not four years, not four months, four days. That means that star is wobbling back and forth quite a bit. But here's the thing. That's not a, that unusual, because if you look at the moons of Jupiter, there's one moon, Io, in there that goes around in less than two days. There's another moon, Europa, that goes around in three and a half days. There are things that go this fast around things. It helps that 51 Pegasi was a relatively small star, and the planet around it was a relatively large planet close in, which meant it was giving it quite a tug back and forth, still is. Uh, so, I mean, it's almost so close it seems to be touching. And that creates other problems. How can a planet like that be so close to the star and not have all its gases boil away? That became a really 
uh, intense kind of study to try to figure that out. And I'm, I'm not entirely convinced with all of the explanations that have been given for it, but, but they are rather interesting. If we luck out and we have planets going edge on, so we see them when they go right in front of the star and right behind the star, we get what's called the transit and eclipse method. A transit is when it's going in front. So again, my head can be the star and my finger as the planet is going in front, this would be a transit as it's going across. Sometimes we can see Venus and Mercury going in front of the sun and that's called a transit as well. When that happens, it blocks part of the light from the star as you see here. If it, we get the, plant, the transit and eclipse, we get two different light dips. And a transit, again, is when it's in front, and eclipse is when it's behind. Uh, we don't often luck out to have things exactly edge on, because sometimes they're going like this. Sometimes that's face on. Most of the time, they're at some kind of angle where they're going to miss being right edge on. But if we hit the jackpot and get the edge on here, we can see two different light curves. When the planet is in front of the star, it dims more. When it's behind the star, it dims less, but it dims a little. And the reasoning behind that is that when it is in front of the star, you're not seeing the backside of the planet because the planet itself doesn't radiate any light. So it's blocking part of the star but you're not getting the planet light. Then when the planet's off to the side, you're getting part of the planet light and the full star. When it goes behind the star as an eclipse, you're still getting the full star, but now you're not getting any planet. So you go from having only part of the star to part of the star and the planet to the full star, but no planet. So you get three different intensities of light. Now, if we get really, really, really lucky. And we have a planet goes in front of its star and we're edge on for it. We might be able to see what's in the atmosphere of that planet. Because again, now my head gets to be the planet rather than uh, the star. My head has an atmosphere. Once upon a time it had more atmosphere, but I'm going bald. Uh, so, so it has an atmosphere. That means the light from the sun comes through the atmosphere and keeps going off the Earth through the atmosphere. That's what turns the moon red during full eclipses, is the light going through our atmosphere gets refracted and bent, and it hits the moon and it's red. Well, if I had a way of measuring the spectrum of the light coming through the atmosphere of the Earth while on the moon there, I could tell it would have nitrogen. I could tell it had oxygen. I could tell it had water vapor. I could tell all of these things. And I could tell that they weren't from the sunlight itself because I can take a measurement of the sun and then I can erase all of that from the light I'm getting that's coming through the atmosphere. What's left over is from the atmosphere, not from the star. And that's how sometimes you'll have announcements that we found an Earth-like planet. We found water vapor on this planet. We found oxygen in the atmosphere of this planet because we're doing a spectrum, a spectral analysis when it's in transit. Now, the best, best, best way to do this was the Kepler spacecraft. And the Kepler spacecraft was only recently decommissioned. Uh, it had some problems and NASA's ingenuity was just really spectacular and they got it up and working again. It took image after image after image after image of about 150,000 stars. And it was looking for those edge on stars and it found hundreds of them that we could analyze well. It found thousands of them that are still sort of waiting to, to see whether or not uh, they, they, they in fact are. But what it would do is it would, it would look for those very minute dips in light that would come across. And that's why you had to take pictures over and over and over and over and over again. Because if you're waiting for Jupiter to come in front of the sun, you can be waiting for 12 years before it comes back into view. So it'll take you 12 years to get it here and then six more years to get it 
as an eclipse and then six more years to get it back to a transit again. So that's why, again, it's easier to find stars with planets that are close in, going around in every four days, for example. And it's easier to find stars that have big planets because they'll block out more of the light. They'll also cause more of a wobble. So, so it's not that there are more of those. It's just those are the easier ones to detect. So that's what we're going to find first, obviously. But it's not just the Hubble and not just the Kepler mission. And I invite you to look up more about the Kepler mission online. In fact, I'll see if I can uh, put up a video for you on the Kepler uh, mission. Uh, I'm going to write myself a note here, uh, video Kepler. I'll put mission here because otherwise I'll remind myself and I'll give you something on the medieval astronomer and that's not who you want. Uh, we do in fact have a couple of direct images. We do have a couple of those direct observations that are the holy grail that we really want. Uh, this is a Keck observation. Keck is a twin uh, telescope observatory on Mauna Kea in the big island of Hawaii. Uh, it gives us in some ways uh, uh, imagery that is as good as Hubble or on a comparable scale with Hubble. Uh, here again, we see uh, a little bit of a blotting out in the center so we can see several planets going around. These, of course, we're looking at it face on. They're going around like this. They're not edge on. Uh, so, so, and again, this is nondescript star, not Aldebaran, not Polaris. It's HR8799. That's, that's one of the uh, uh, catalogs uh, that's out there. We have different techniques where we can find and enhance the light. This is another photo. This is a brown dwarf star. So this is a star whose engine didn't kick on. And yet, even they have planets. Ta-da, there you go. Planets, not just for real stars anymore. And as we have been discovering more and more and more, you can sort of see here, uh, we have a huge cluster of, of planets. See the orbital period here is in days. So we have a huge cluster of those with orbits that take very, very little time. And notice here's one, one day to go around. Notice how many stars we have with planets that take less than a day to go around. It's, it's, it's quite, quite something. These are Earth-sized planets. These are Neptune-sized planets. This is Jupiter, uh, Jupiter-sized planets up here. Uh, when we're talking about masses, Earth is, we would say, is one. We'd say Neptune is 17 Earth masses. We would say Jupiter is 300, actually 318 uh, Earth masses that's there. So, so remember, uh, Earth takes uh, 365 and a quarter days to go around the sun. So there are a lot of Earth-sized planets that take less than a day. Imagine that. You could reach drinking age real fast on planets like that. So Kepler discoveries, again, planet size with Earth as being one. Again, lots of skewing towards the sort of larger than Earth size. Uh, there are not so many that are in the Jupiter size. We tend to find Jupiter size ones in other uh, ways uh, along the way. By the time we're getting up here to the 8, 10, 12, and more, the, there aren't too many planets of that size because by the time we get up to here, and especially by the time we get to 23, this would be a really weird planet because by the time you're that large, you should be a small star. So the sort of bridge between when a planet becomes a star is going to be over here. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, when, when we're looking at um, uh, uh, sort of, well, actually the, the bridge to get to be a star, I'm misspeaking a little bit, the bridge to being a star is about 10 times the size of Jupiter. So when we're sort of looking over here in, in this column for Jupiter, we don't get too many that are too much larger than Jupiter before they begin to become stars themselves. Uh, so, so one of the things when we're looking at planets around stars similar to the sun. We've got some stars that are much smaller, much larger. Again, we're finding it, 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 it sort of skews towards things that are larger than we are. We're not finding too many things that are smaller. 
But again, those are harder to detect. So that's why we're not finding those, not that they aren't necessarily there. And as we look for exoplanets around uh, uh, other stars with different kinds of materials, uh, we see there are some iron planets, some rocky planets, some water planets, uh, and some gas giant planets along the way. And you can sort of see the distribution here. And if you think about our solar system, uh, we've got four in this region over here, and we've got four in this region over here. So you've got two down here, we've got two here, and then we've got our gas giants, these, these little blue uh, uh, triangles sort of show us where our planets are in our solar system. Uh, so, so when we're looking at our solar system versus other solar systems, one of the things we try to do is compare like and like, Jupiters with Jupiters. Uh, one of the key differences is when you have a hot Jupiter, it's much, much closer to the sun than ours. For a long time, conventional wisdom was the reason why Jupiter is where it is and has persisted where it is, is it's outside the frost line. It's out beyond where the sun's energy is going to bubble the gases away. Well, we have lots of planets that are as big as Jupiter, gas giants, but much closer into their sun, and their top cloud temperatures are huge, hugely different. Top cloud temperature here at 130 K, uh, that's still minus 143 Celsius. So we're talking minus 200, minus 250 in Fahrenheit. That's cold. That's North Dakota in the winter cold. This here melts iron, and yet the gases don't bubble away. So it's really interesting. As I mentioned before, that was one of the, the, one of the areas where we're trying to figure out how that can be. Now, every star that's out there puts out energy. Every star out there has an area that is just sort of like the three bears, an area that's too hot, that's too cold, and is just right. The just right area, and when, when we're saying just right, we mean for conditions for life to be supported on a planet. We call that the habitable zone. You will also hear it sometimes referred to as the Goldilocks zone for the three bears. When Mercury goes around the sun, it's way too hot. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, way too cold. But Earth is just right. Guess what? Mars is also in the habitable zone. Once upon a time, Venus might have been in the habitable zone. The sun is sort of gradually heating up very, very slowly. It's not the cause of global warming. So that's that uh, radio talk show hosts who say, oh, the sun is heating up. That's why it's got no, no, that is not the case at all. But over the course of billions of years, yes, that will make a difference. So once upon a time, the habitable zone might have been a little bit further in when the sun was a little bit cooler. Venus might have been part of that. And Mars might have been in the too cold zone. Every star has a habitable zone. The habitable zone is going to be circular around that in the disk of the planets. It's actually a spherical bubble. but the planets go around in the disk there. So it's going to be circular. The orbits of the planets are not necessarily circular. So if you had planets that are going sort of cigar-shaped orbits in and out of the habitable zone, that's not going to make that planet at all habitable because it's going to freeze and boil successively. That's not going to help. A very hot star is going to have a big habitable zone far away from the star. A very cool star will have a thinner, a smaller uh, habitable zone closer into the star. Uh, both of those become problematic because if you have stars that are, or planets that are way, way out from the star, uh, they take a very long time to go around. If you have something that's very thin around the cooler star, then what happens is the likelihood the, the planet's going to edge out in the too hot or too cold zone is, is, is much, much higher along the way. Of course, the big O stars burn themselves out really quickly. Remember, they, they don't last all that long. So they might not even last long enough for planets to completely form out of the protoplanet uh, uh, stage. But these dimmer stars will last a lot longer, but it's harder to sink right in 
with the planets in their habitable zones, especially if there's more than one because they're going to tug on each other and perhaps tug it out of the habitable zone. We do have some evidence, however. Again, thank you, Kepler. If you ever see a system with the name like Kepler 62, that means that came from that uh, uh, research platform, the Kepler mission and the Kepler spacecraft. Uh, Kepler 62 has a bunch of different kinds of planets, as we can sort of see here. Uh, we're, we're talking the sort of habitable zone. Here they're including Venus in a proto-habitable zone space. We can see the planets of the Kepler-62 system also in their habitable zone. So that's a, a planetary system consistent with having water on the surface. So we have many, many possibilities that are out there. When we're looking at the spectrum from the, the atmospheres, when we're looking at them and seeing that they're in their habitable zones, when we're doing uh, the, the sort of analysis to see that they're in circular orbits, we can figure out more and more about planets that are out there. And we figure there are quite a number of Earth-like planets out there. In fact, in our own solar system, we have two. Mars is an Earth-like planet, may have had water once upon a time, may have had a much thicker atmosphere once upon a time. And when I say may, I'm saying it's almost a certainty now. I'm, I'm still going to hedge it a little bit because we don't have complete, complete evidence. But whereas it used to be sort of wild speculation, now it's sort of like, yeah, I, I, I would bet my retirement funds on it. Uh, so, so, so yeah, that's an interesting thing. Because of that, we have a growth field called astrobiology. Astrobiology did not exist when I was a student in the 101 class. By the time I was taking a master's degree in astronomy, I had a complete course in astrobiology. And by the time I began to teach here uh, in astronomy, you can now get a complete master's degree in astrobiology. Astrobiology is one of those hybrid disciplinary fields because you need to study, as it would imply in the name, astronomy and biology. But you also need to study physics and chemistry and geology, and math would be good as well. Uh, so so it, you need to learn a lot here. Uh, but one of the things we're doing as we look at astrobiological principles is what do we really need to look for to see what is living out there? Will all life look similar to what it is here on Earth? Or will there be different kinds of life? Think about Star Trek, it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. Can there be life based on silicon rather than carbon? Can there be life that doesn't use water as a liquid? Uh, we're even speculating that might be a possibility within our own solar system. Because if you go to one of the moons of Saturn, we have a moon called Titan. It has an atmosphere. That atmosphere has methane and ethane. That has carbon. It also has liquid on the surface, but it's not liquid water because it's way too cold for that. But it's got, again, liquid methane and ethane. Well, you have energy to keep it from completely freezing. You have carbon and you have liquid. Those are the three things you need for life. So could there be life that's not water-based there? Could be really interesting. Could there be life that's not DNA? Uh, based. Is that a, an Earth-specific thing? That will be interesting as well. So if we're looking for life, we're typically looking for it on nearby planets, but in fact, that's just a small drop in the cosmic ocean as we look for hundreds of billions of stars in our own galaxy and then hundreds of billions of galaxies that are out there. So there are different ways of speculating about this, different ways of trying to do experiments. The Miller-Urey experiment was done decades ago, and it was one of these really fascinating kinds of experiments. Because as I mentioned, typically people thought the three things you need for life are water, carbon, and energy. So what they did was they boiled some water. They had the boiling water mixed with various gases like we might have had in the early Earth atmosphere, including our carbon thing here. We also have our hydrogen molecules and our ammonia uh, things there to see what kinds of reactions might happen. And then you add a spark. 
which might be lightning rod, a lightning bolt, might be volcanic eruptions. You never know what might add energy to a system. And what was coming out of this? We've never done this experiment and had some like creepy crawly walk out. But it produces amino acids. Those are the building blocks of life. Just from this simple experiment that we can do in a high school chemistry lab. This isn't even sort of stuff that you need super colliding superconductors kind, kinds of things. Uh, so, so, so here we have, uh, uh, though that should really be superconducting super collider. I was making a joke there. So life might be far more common. We can actually find amino acids in other parts of the universe. So how likely is life? We have an equation that was put together by Frank Drake, and he was putting this together back during the Cold War. And the likelihood of our contacting people, uh, you may hear bings in the background, someone seems to be blowing up my Facebook, I'm sorry. Um, so, so the likelihood of our making contact with intelligent civilizations out in the universe is an equation based on these variables. First, you start with the number of stars that we've got. And I would add one more thing in here. First, you have to say how many galaxies we have, then how many stars per galaxy. But we're not really likely, honestly, to ever, ever communicate in any way that we can imagine technologically with anyone outside of our own galaxy anytime in the next couple of hundred million years. So we can, we can use the Frank Drake equation and think just about the number of stars. But if you wanted to add another variable in there, you could add number of galaxies times number of stars. How many of those stars have planets? How many of those planets are in habitable zones? How many of those planets in habitable zones have life that forms? How many of those life forms actually develop intelligent life? And how many of them succeed in not blowing themselves up. Because during the Cold War, there, that was a persistent fear. And it's still a rather a bit of a fear today with, with uh, continuing concerns about environmental degradation and pandemics and uh, nuclear war isn't even top of the list anymore as to what could destroy us. And then of course you could have the good old fashioned asteroid hit uh, uh, along the way. So, so, so this, destruction thing doesn't necessarily need to be nuclear. I might add a couple other variables in here as well, uh, and, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But let's just stick with this equation here. We had a pretty good sense for this number. This number actually grows. When I was taking the 101 class in astronomy or the 102 class in astronomy, I lived in a spiral galaxy with 100 billion stars. 30 years later, I live in a barred spiral galaxy with up to 400 billion stars. Things change. It's not that we added 300 billion stars, it's we sort of figured out how to measure them more properly. So we know this number. Before 1995, we had no idea what this number was. So before 1995, the whole rest of this equation was just who knows. Now we know that pretty much every second star out there has planets. And we know that a good percentage of those, this number goes up and down too, uh, but a good percentage of those planets are in habitable zones. And a good percentage of those have conditions on the surface that could generate life. This is where we really stop now with the equation variables, because we have numbers for these three plus one more if we include the galaxies. Uh, we have good numbers for these. They will vary up and down, but we can now plug, start plugging things in meaningfully, not just speculatively. Uh, these, we have no idea, because right now the number is one, one, and we're still not sure. The reason why I might add a couple of other variables in here is we might have intelligent creatures on a planet, like whales or dolphins or chimpanzees, that never develop radio telescopes, never develop television, never develop telephones. And therefore, anyone from another planet is never going to be able to contact them. They're not going to be able to contact anyone else. 
We also might add another variable in here for the time, because we've had human beings on our planet now who we might classify as intelligent beings for thousands of years. They've had reading, they've had writing, they've had architecture, they've had agriculture, but they haven't had cell phones. They haven't had telephones, they haven't had radios. That's all been within just the last hundred years. So we might add that as a variable too. We have to be reaching out to an intelligent species. So whales might qualify, but they don't have radios. And it has to be at a time when they have radios. Julius Caesar wouldn't be of any help here. George Washington wouldn't be of any help here. So, so we might add a couple of variables in there. So there are three possibilities. Possibility one, we're it. We're the only ones out there. No one else has developed anything and no one else is going to. There's also the really optimistic case that there are civilizations possible on every other planet that's out there. That's sort of the Star Trek case. Every time they go to a new star system, there's some new uh, exciting civilization that they encounter and suddenly they all speak English from the 20th century. That's another issue. How will we know what they're talking about? Because they're not gonna speak to us the way we speak. Then there's the interim case where it might be fairly rare. This becomes more problematic because it's not only that they're spread out in space, they could also be spread out in time. If we lose our technology in a thousand years, that means if someone didn't contact us between World War I and World War V or whatever it is, they're, then they're out of luck. We were intelligent enough and listening and broadcasting for that time, but now we're off the air. Uh, so, so that becomes more problematic. So the only time we're probably really going to be picking up a lot of signals from other places and hope that they might pick up ours is the optimistic case here. SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is a real program. Uh, Seth Shostak is one of the guys who runs that program, uh, and it has its own telescopes, radio telescopes. Uh, it actually beams messages out as well. And they have to sift through lots and lots and lots of things looking for patterns that don't look like they're natural patterns, because if they can be relegated to some natural cause or some earth-based cause, then we know that's not an, a, an indicator of extraterrestrial life. So one in 10 stars examined so far turn out to be planets. That number actually keeps changing. So we're, we're speculating based on what we've seen is that probably one in two stars have planets that are out there. And we keep finding more and more and more Earth-sized planets as our detection abilities get better and better. So there's quite a lot of stuff out there. It's very exciting. You're at, alive at a crucial moment in the discovery of things extraterrestrial. Because for the first time, we can actually plug into the universe and listen to what's there to see what's there in gamma rays, in x-rays, in radio waves, in microwaves, in infrared waves, in ultraviolet waves, and in good old Roy G. Biff. We're the first couple of generations who can do that, and we're the first generation to know there are other planets out there. And we're the first generation to be able to really take advantage of all of this technology. So we are right at the beginning of figuring these things out. So and I invite you to think about careers that might keep you interested and involved in these kinds of things, because this is the future. Welcome to it. And I will see you for chapter 22.